This physicist made understanding how the universe began and how it will end his life's work. General relativity predicted that the universe, and time itself, would begin in the Big Bang. It also predicted that time would come to an end in black holes. Physicist Stephen Hawking recognized that the key to unlocking the mysteries of these bookend events, and everything in between, is gravity, which is a mystery itself. I'm Seth Chostak. I'm Molly Bentley. Welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we give you the wide-angle view on science and technology. Just as in the heart of our galaxy lies a supermassive black hole, in the heart of Stephen Hawking's work lies gravity. Its weird behavior on both small scales and large led to his profound insight about black holes and the nature of space and time themselves. He profoundly changed how we see the universe, but some mysteries about gravity eluded even his brilliant mind, such as connecting it to the other forces to create a theory of everything. In this episode, Stephen Hawking, Gravity in Its Many Forms, The Theory of Everything, and What It Was Like to Work with the Famous Physicist. It's Hawking Gravity. You think your apartment is crowded with junk? Well, let's clean it up. Imagine all that stuff, you know, the couch, your dartboards, shelves of books, and the cat litter box being stuffed down, 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 way down to the size of a pinhead. No, not a pinhead. A hundred million times smaller than an electron. Congratulations, you have created a black hole. Now, don't worry, they're usually not dangerous, although eventually the whole universe will be a bunch of black holes. But the thing about black holes is that they pack a lot of mass into a very tiny volume. Some of physicist Stephen Hawking's most profound work was about gravity and about black holes, such as the description of their behavior. He envisioned black holes as gravity run amok. A black hole has a boundary called the event horizon. Falling through the event horizon is a bit like going over Niagara Falls in a canoe. If you are above the falls, you can get away if you paddle fast enough, but once you are over the edge, you are lost. There's no way back. You're familiar with the effect of gravity on large objects. As described by Isaac Newton, it's what keeps you seated on the couch and not floating above it. In the 17th century, Professor Newton thought of gravity as a force. He couldn't have known that physics was going to get very, very weird. Well, sometime between Isaac Newton and Stephen Hawking, there was this guy called Albert Einstein. In fact, he replaced Isaac Newton's theory of gravity. He replaced it with a new theory in which gravity was no longer a force, but space and time could bend and respond to the presence of masses and and bodies were just trying to follow the straightest path possible in a curved space-time. This is a profound change in our picture of the universe and of reality itself. And Stephen Hawking was one of the leading scientists into this theory and asking what are its consequences. Dr. Hawking seized on Einstein's idea that gravity was really a consequence of geometry. Mass warps space, and gravity is the result of the fact that space gets warped. And if you had sufficient mass bending space, you would create a black hole. Now, for a long time, physicists thought that black holes were a one-way ticket. Objects go in and never come out. Stephen Hawking thought so too, and added a but. He realized that, like most objects in the universe, black holes don't stay unchanged. Eventually, they shrink and die. His realization came about by imagining what takes place at a black hole's event horizon, that imaginary boundary outside the black hole that is the point of no return for anything falling in. But Hawking realized that some bizarre events near the horizon would cause the black hole to radiate particles into space and lose mass. This led in 1974 to what some would argue is his crowning achievement. Hawking radiation was a really spectacular discovery because nobody saw it coming, nobody anticipated it. Before Stephen discovered Hawking radiation, we thought that nothing ever got out of a black hole. 
And what, what he showed was that black holes aren't really black, that they eventually, sometimes we call it evaporate, it's not normal evaporation, but they get smaller, they give off energy. And that was really a shock. And he discovered that by combining, in some way, quantum mechanics with gravity. The two come into play at the event horizon, where gravity is strong and where quantum particles act in bizarre ways. The idea is really that if you just look at pure gravity, then a black hole creates an event horizon, which is just a region beyond which not even light can escape. And that makes it seem as though the black hole couldn't possibly radiate, because when you radiate, you're emitting stuff, you're emitting particles. And what Hawking realized is that when you add quantum mechanics, when you start to add the deep fundamental nature, quantum nature of matter, that in fact there is this very subtle process by which the black hole can actually get smaller and emit particles. We'll hear more later about the consequences of Hawking radiation for the fate of the universe. Stephen Hawking's theoretical insights were remarkable, all the more because he made them while living with a neurodegenerative disease. Colleagues who worked with Hawking found the circumstances of collaboration challenging and profoundly inspirational. I'm physicist and author Leonard Mladenov. He met Stephen Hawking when the British physicist asked Dr. Mladenov to collaborate on a book, A Briefer History of Time. He was interested in writing a more understandable version of A Brief History of Time. As he put it, that he thought it was one of the most bought, least read books. <laughs> and he wanted to say it more clearly, and he asked me to help him. The two went on to write a second book. When Stephen Hawking died in March 2018, Dr. Mladenov wrote an op-ed for the New York Times about what it was like to work with a man whose disability paralyzed his body but left his imagination free to roam the cosmos. Leonard, you wrote in the New York Times an op-ed uh, which said that when you heard Stephen Hawking had died, you broke down in tears, and, you know, you felt the way that many people did, and that somehow Hawking would always be around. What was it about Stephen Hawking that made us think that that might be true in some sense? Well, he lived with his disability in such a powerful way that it seemed that he could overcome anything. When you sat next to him and actually saw him in person, even more so than when, if you saw him on TV, you could see the struggles that he had to go through just to express himself, just to speak. On TV, when you see him, his answers are generally pre-written. He would click on a button that would voice what he had previously composed. But when you're with him, he's doing it in real time. And he spoke at about six words a minute. So even an ordinary conversation took a great deal of iron will and effort. Now, by this point, he was not only confined to a wheelchair, but he couldn't write, he couldn't speak. Is that correct? Oh, yeah, that happened much earlier. And so the way he communicated was kind of like playing a video game. He had rows of letters on the screen, and the cursor jumped from one row to the next. And if you click as a, click on a mouse, let's say, then you could capture that row, and then it starts, the cursor would start going across the row, and you pick a letter, and then you can spell out words that way, but also the computer would offer you words that began with the first letter or the first two, whatever you had typed. And at first he used his thumb to click a mouse to do this, and later as the disease progressed, he wasn't able to do that, but he could still use his face. And so they put a motion sensor on his glasses, and he would twitch his cheek to click the mouse, and that's how he would compose words. All right. Well, given the lack of the usual I.O. channels, if you will, speaking, wielding a piece of chalk and in front of a blackboard, I mean, that surely made working with him fairly tedious in the sense that it was very slow. It was slow, but it was very interesting, um, especially now that I, you know, I write books about psychology and neuroscience. And I, I, I'm very aware of the dynamics and interaction, what's going on in your head. And at first, when I sat next to him, I would daydream or be impatient, as you said. Uh, and at some point, I noticed that I could see that he's composing the sentences. I could see them come to life on his screen before he would finish. When he finished, he would, if I hadn't interrupted him because I could tell what he was saying, he would click and they would voice the sentence. But I could watch him as he thought, as he composed his thoughts. And this was very... I realized different from a normal conversation, from the way we process information in a normal conversation. When you and I talk or when two people speak uh, together casually, 
you answer each other almost immediately. Usually there are no 30-second, one-minute, two-minute pauses between saying something. But since I could watch Stephen compose his sentence and figure out what he was saying often minutes before he finished composing it, if I didn't want to answer right away, I could sit there and think about what he was saying. And it was a very interesting way of communicating because I found that it, you get a very much deeper interaction that way. And it was really, it was really extraordinary. It sounds as if he had a sort of autocomplete on the interface in front of him, that, uh, that screen, but that you were a kind of autocomplete for his thoughts, right? <laughs> well, some t- yeah, you could autocomplete in your head and then think about it before answering, which I often did. Um, it was also funny if he did autocomplete and got it wrong. He, he had an interesting <laughs> expression for when he, when he got annoyed. So, if, you know, it's one thing you, you, I might say, oh, are you saying this? And, he, you know, he would, with his face, he could say no. He, he would kind of wince. But if you started guessing too many times, like twice, <laughs> about it and were wrong again, then, then you got this kind of steely-eyed, like, shut up look. <laughs> 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 shut up and let me finish. Stop climbing into my head and trying to guess what I'm going to say. Well, you know, obviously, Leonard, in theoretical physics, much of what you do is mathematical. Since he couldn't write, is it true that Hawking did these calculations in his head? Or or would you write something on the blackboard, for example, and he would comment? Well, sometimes I would, but that wasn't necessarily to benefit him or <laughs> to benefit me. Uh, he he did his physics in his head, and I it, I don't know how he did it. It's another miracle of Stephen Hawking, another reason that it, he didn't seem mortal. In high school, I, I knew someone who would play a dozen or 15 simultaneous games of chess blindfolded and then go from table to table remembering the situation. You would tell him what your move was, and he'd make his next move and then move on to the next table. And I guess it was something like that that Stephen could do. He, he could visualize uh, and hold a tremendous amount of data in his working memory and he thought geometrically, which helped, rather than more algebraically where you're using equations. He thought more in pictures. But I don't know how he did it, but it was pretty amazing because no one else can do that. Yeah, <laughs> I, was... I know among, among physicists. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, perhaps it's just my upbringing. Is but... that how you work, Seth? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I find the idea of doing mathematics in my head rather than on paper. That's totally scary. <laughs> Leonard, you've written a book called Elastic about the importance of flexibility in thinking. I assume that uh, Hawking was elastic, right? Because he, he wasn't always right. Elastic thinking is what really defined him in a way. Elastic thinking is thinking that is not logical, rational, analytical thinking. It's not programmed. It's not following rules to get to from A to B. It's breaking rules. It's inventing the new rules. It's learning to understand and question your assumptions and look at things that have changed and see when things change. And just look at his life. In his 20s, he was given two years to live. And, of course, that was some physical miracle. I can't say you could credit his mental prowess with that. But then when he did his Ph.D., he worked on black holes, which everyone said is a dead end. And it wasn't a dead end. He made it not a dead end. So the assumption was that that they will never see these or, or the ramifications of them. So why study them? And how could they be interesting? And he showed that theoretically they're related to the origin of the universe and that even taken on their own, that they have immense importance in understanding quantum gravity. So he was someone who started new paradigms and could really think outside the box. So I think that was one of his greatest qualities. Leonard Mladenov, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Thank you, Seth. Leonard Mladenov is a physicist and author with Stephen Hawking of A Briefer History of Time and The Grand Design. Dr. Mladenov's most recent book is Elastic, Flexible Thinking in a Time of Change. Coming up, you may need flexible thinking to absorb what Stephen Hawking's theory about black holes implies for the fate of our universe. And later in the show, gravity gets even stranger. It's Hawking Gravity on Big Picture Science. Black holes are stealthy. They've never been observed directly. Only the motion of objects or gases around them tell us a massive object is there. 
The first suspected black hole was indirectly observed in 1971 when astronomers discovered X-rays emanating from the neighborhood of a bright blue star, a star that had a buddy. It was in orbit around something massive, but not anything we could see. Around that time, Stephen Hawking was describing the strange behavior at the edge of a black hole, now known as Hawking radiation. It's that behavior that causes black holes to slowly lose mass and disappear. But there is more to say on that phenomenon, because that radiation of particles from a black hole plays a role in the ultimate fate of the universe. So says physicist and astronomer Jan Levin of Bernard College of Columbia University. Yes? We're talking the end, the big goodbye, the ultimate terminus, the great cosmic toodaloo. That's because Hawking radiation is evidence that, unlike diamonds, black holes are not forever. Yeah, well, we thought they were forever, exactly, and that they could only get bigger. That's a one-way street. Black holes can only grow. And what Hawking realized is that over a very, very long time scale, much, much, much longer than the age of the current universe, a large black hole, a black hole the size of a star, will eventually not only evaporate, but explode in the final stages together. So the black hole has a kind of temperature at which it is evaporating, and it's cooler the bigger the black hole and it's hotter the smaller the black hole. So right now, all the black holes we know of in the universe are too cold to possibly notice that they're evaporating. It's only after a very, very, very long time in the far future that they'll be small enough that the temperature will be hot enough that we would imagine it being detectable. But by then, presumably, we'll be long gone. Now, I've heard it said that the last thing that will happen in our universe because it seems that the universe is going to go on forever. The last thing that will happen is a giant black hole evaporating and exploding, and, and that's it. Nothing more happens. Is that right? You mean in the far future, is that the kind of fate of the universe? I think that is a realistic possibility, is that everything that can will fall into black holes, and that the black holes will eventually evaporate in an explosion at the end of their lives, and that will be the last major event that the universe witnesses. After that, no more news. No more news. <laughs> Maybe you could explain, you know, how they do evaporate, because, of course, it's not in the way that a puddle of water evaporates. If nothing can escape from a black hole, how yeah. can it get smaller and, and go away? It's actually a really gorgeous realization. So right outside the event horizon, let's suppose space is completely empty. There's no actual matter in the universe. In quantum mechanics, you can't ever really say that there's nothing there. If you've ever heard of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, it's the idea that you cannot precisely pinpoint the location of a particle and its energy or momentum. And that very subtle idea leads to the possibility that if you can't precisely pinpoint if something's there, you can't actually say it's not there either. And so there's a literally a quantum limit to what nothing means. Nothing doesn't mean that there's never particles there. It just means that they're kind of popping in and out, frothing in this quantum fluctuations. And what Hawking realized is if two particles come out of the vacuum, one of them can be stolen by the black hole, and then the other one can't go back to being nothing again. It's like you've ruined it. One of the analogies I like to give is to say, imagine empty space has the color green. And when two particles come from empty space, they can be a blue particle and a yellow particle, because together they make green. But once the blue particle gets stolen by the black hole, the yellow one can't go back to the vacuum again. And it actually escapes and travels far away. And so if you were looking from far away, you would receive this yellow particle. And you would say, that looks like it came from the black hole. But in fact, it comes from right outside the black hole. Okay, so things don't actually have to escape from a black hole. It's, it's just there to suck in, I don't know, your, your, your twin brother or something, and the other brother can escape. That's right. But the weird thing is, because of the odd nature of space and time, when the black hole absorbs the partner particle, it can actually make it lighter. And that is just a very strange peculiarity of what happens when you cross the event horizon of space and time switching places. And so the black hole actually gets a little bit lighter in this process, not heavier. And that's really odd. And that was so odd that you would have thought it was wrong. And while Hawking's discovery of Hawking radiation has incited a lot of controversy, none of it is about the mechanism itself. Everyone believes that, yes, in fact, this is how black holes would evaporate. That's not controversial. 
Well, let me ask you about another strange behavior, and perhaps it's related to this uh, uh, black hole radiation (laughs) problem, and that is what's called the information paradox. And uh, I I guess that's not a reference to how poor my local paper has become. The uh, black hole information paradox, what might that be? Well, Hawking, when he wrote this paper, he knew that he had really begun a kind of uh, a revolution of sorts because it doesn't the story doesn't end there he knew that it meant something really profound and that is because the black hole evaporation in some sense never involves anything from the inside coming out you would have let's say a black hole that you made with a bunch of matter and that matter carries with it quantum information about that matter, and yet this black hole is getting lighter and lighter without ever revealing that information that it's kept trapped behind the event horizon through this subtle process. And so it's as though you've yanked the curtain up when the black hole is gone and explodes, and all of that information trapped in the matter has just disappeared. It never made it out of the black hole. And so the argument became... Well, if the Hawking radiation carries no information, then there's something really pathological about the universe because all of our laws of physics tell us this kind of information cannot be lost. It cannot be destroyed. It might be very hard to reconstruct. If I take your local newspaper and I burn it up in flames, it's going to be very, very hard for me to reconstruct the information that was in the paper, but it's technically possible. The information's not lost. It's just scattered. In this example, it is fundamentally lost. And the only single example that had ever been presented in the history of physics where the information would be lost. And so quantum theorists started to argue with the relativists, the ones on the side of event horizons and black holes, about whether or not information really leaked out and how did it happen. And so this has been going on now for 30 years, more. Well, did Hawking have a point of view here? I mean, this is still an unresolved puzzle? Well, yeah, it's funny. So Hawking definitely wagered that the information was lost, yet Hawking conceded. He conceded to people like Lenny Susskind, who are on the quantum side, saying even though he couldn't show exactly how it made its way out, he made some very interesting um, and subtle arguments and compelling arguments that it must be the case that the information gets out. And so Hawking conceded, and some people thought he conceded too soon because the debate still goes on. All right. Well, finally, Jana, Stephen Hawking is, as you pointed out, probably going to be remembered for his black hole research. What was so appealing about black holes? They just seem like a pathology uh, in the cosmos, just you know, something that can go wrong if you have a big star and it dies or something like that. But he was intrigued by it, not because he was interested in stars particularly. What grabbed him there? Yeah, so black holes are profoundly interesting in the sense that they're unlike any other object you can imagine in the universe, not just discussing the peculiarities, but in the following sense that I can tell the difference between one chair and another chair. They're not identical in any sense. One star and another star, a person and another person. Black holes of a certain mass and spin are absolutely indistinguishably identical to every other black hole with that mass and spin. And that is a very profound statement. It makes them like they're fundamental particles, fundamental gravitational particles, as though there's something about them that is deeper in the laws of physics than other things that we're used to. And that sense of black hole is not a composite of other things. It is literally an empty region, a place in space-time. It is empty as far as you are concerned. Whatever that stuff was that made the black hole in the first place is long gone. And you can't tell if it was made of Encyclopedia Britannica's or Tesla's or if it was made of dark matter. You actually can never know that information. And so... People think you can make black holes at accelerators, that you can make black holes little tiny ones in the early universe because there's something about them that's fundamental. And I can't make little chairs in accelerators in the early universe, or I can't make little stars, but I could make little black holes. And so black holes become a terrain, and a very special terrain, on which to play out the laws of physics to figure out what's next, what's deeper, what's deeper than gravity, what's deeper than quantum mechanics. And so that's really the beauty. They offer us that playground. Jan Levin, thanks so very much for speaking with us. Thank you so much. Great to be on the show.
Jana Levin is a physicist and astronomer at Barnard College of Columbia University, and she is the author of Black Hole Blues and Other Songs from Outer Space. It was fitting that Stephen Hawking held the Lucasian Chair of Mathematics at Cambridge University, one of the most prestigious posts in the world. This chair was also held by Sir Isaac Newton, another gravity researcher. And in turn, Stephen Hawking inspired a new generation of astronomers and physicists to make their own studies into the nature of gravity and black holes. One recent and exciting pursuit was predicted by general relativity, gravitational waves. These are ripples in space-time that are generated by any accelerating object, but really go gangbusters as a consequence of the most violent and energetic phenomena in the universe. For instance, two black holes like fish swirling in a pond will create waves in the shape of space around them so that if you were floating nearby, you would literally bob and be knocked around. Your motion would be altered by the passing of the wave. Hi, my name is Richard Camuccio, and I'm a graduate research assistant at the Center for Gravitational Wave Astronomy. Hi, I'm Walton Rattray, and I'm a grad student at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley. The Center for Gravitational Wave Astronomy at the University of Texas Rio Grande Valley collaborates with LIGO, the large-scale physics experiment that set out to detect gravitational waves. And in 2015, the LIGO team did. Ladies and gentlemen, we have detected gravitational waves. We did it. I would like to congratulate the LIGO team on their groundbreaking discovery. These results confirm several very important predictions of Einstein's theory of general relativity. The observed properties of this system is consistent with predictions about black holes that I made in 1970 here in Cambridge. Gravitational waves provide a completely new way of looking at the universe. The ability to detect them has the potential to revolutionize astronomy. Black holes are not the only objects that create detectable gravitational waves. In 2017, LIGO, working with a similar instrument in Italy called Virgo, made the first detection of gravitational waves coming from colliding neutron stars. Neutron stars. They form when stars that are a few times heftier than the sun die. They collapse under their own weight and the remnant is no bigger than Manhattan Island, but so dense that a teaspoonful would weigh one billion tons. So don't add it to your cake mix. And okay, so neutron stars don't collapse enough to form black holes, but when they collide, they create enough brouhaha to make detectable gravitational waves. Richard Camuccio and Walton Rattray were at the American Association for the Advancement of Science meeting in Austin, Texas, to present the latest results from the LIGO gravitational wave detector. So instead of two black holes orbiting each other and merging, we observed for the first time two neutron stars, which are the remnants of supernovae. So they're the cores of dead stars that were orbiting each other. And when they collide, they produce a massive explosion called a kilonova. Which is similar to a supernova, but on a different scale. It's just an electromagnetic radiation event. And this kilonova is not only visible in gravitational waves, but it's also visible in visible light and gamma rays and x-rays and other forms of electromagnetic radiation. And we found that this is the source of a lot of the heavy element production in the universe. So unstable elements heavier than uranium are produced in these events. Walton, how did you react when you discovered that gravitational waves had indeed been discovered? Well, to quote my advisor, we were caught in our underwear. <laughs> were you literally caught in your underwear? Unfortunately, no, but what, what, it's metaphorical. But uh, basically what happened is I received the signal, I think, early in the morning. I didn't check the text until later that day, and it was my advisor saying, oh my gosh, he's freaking out, typing in all caps, and I'm like, what's going on, what's going on? It was actually very uh, surprising and exhilarating because we finally discovered something new in the universe and did what LIGO was meant to do. Now, you're with um, CGWA. Of course, we're at the AAAS. Everything's in acronyms. What is CGWA? CGWA is the Center for Gravitational Wave Astronomy. And what we do is uh, we receive a signal from LIGO. And based on that receipt, what we'll have is an immediate action to use our own telescopes, our optical telescopes, to look in the general region where the gravitational wave possibly came from. Richard, now Walter's talking about um, observing the universe and the source of these gravitational waves in visible light. 
Now there's lots of different radio waves traveling through the universe. What might you see through the visible spectrum? Right, so the visible spectrum gives you an advantage because, well, first off, it's the thing that we're most familiar with as humans. But also, if you take something called a spectrum in optical light, you can actually see the elemental composition of the star. So when you observe the same phenomenon in different wavelengths of light, you can see a different angle, so to speak, of that same phenomenon. You can build a bigger picture. Now, in the case of black holes, of course, you can't see them in the visible spectrum. Yeah, that's correct. So when you have black holes, they'll merge and they'll only produce gravitational radiation, but with uh, an optical component, you'll have either a neutron star producing some visible light. LIGO would be capable of seeing supernovae, which people are more familiar with. We haven't discovered those yet with gravitational waves. They're elusive, but you could also see those in optical light as well. Now, Walton mentioned supernovae, as you did. Um, we also have neutron stars and black holes, and these are all snapshots in the life of a star, aren't they? A star dies and these things happen. Could you put them in chronological order for us? Sure, yeah, and there's a, there's a few ways it can go. Typically, you need a massive star that reaches the end of its life by basically running out of fuel to sustain it. So once its fuel runs out, it succumbs to gravity and it collapses. And when the core collapses, if it's massive enough, it'll either become a neutron star or a black hole. And uh, one of the biggest mysteries is how do these black holes get close enough together to start orbiting each other? These neutron stars get close enough to start orbiting each other. And so there's various paths that it can evolve, but what we wind up having after the star dies is these remnants, these dense remnants, either a neutron star or a black hole. Now the cool thing about a black hole is that it's dark, you cannot see it. Now what uh, LIGO has been able to do in the recent years is actually let us see a black hole by listening to it. And what I mean by listening is we could actually have uh, our interferometers pick up a signal, convert that gravitational signal into light, and then by uh, measuring the frequency of the light, we can actually have a wave. So what that does is, if you put it to sound, you can actually listen to what you're seeing, which, which is the effect of the gravitational wave. But everything, Richard, gives off gravitational waves, so why do black holes and neutron stars capture the headlines? I believe that we all are giving off gravitational waves right now, so why not turn LIGO on the three of us? Right, so everything that has what we call an asymmetrical mass distribution, so something that's not symmetrical, like a spinning ball that's perfectly smooth. Mine is definitely asymmetrical mass <laughs> distribution, so go on. Right. I still qualify so far, right. go on. Yeah, so, so, we so, so far so good, but the problem is uh, gravitational waves are so weak, right? So if you look at Einstein's equations, they'll predict the existence of gravitational waves, but they'll predict them on a very weak scale. And the only way you can reveal them is if you have extremely massive objects. So black holes are the primary candidate at this point because they're the ones most easily accessible to our detectors. They're very massive and as they get close enough together they start to distort space-time and produce gravitational waves that are at least perceptible to instruments in LIGO. Finally, what should we be looking for in the coming years with LIGO? Just briefly, what might we see? Well, there's going to be a few things that you can be on the lookout for. New phenomena, for sure. We still need to find supernovae, you know, find different forms of gravitational radiation sources, but also new ways that the astronomical community works together. So, you know, LIGO has been on the stage for many years and has recently been making these discoveries, but now with the recent discovery with binary neutron stars, the general astronomical community has a lot to learn from LIGO and, and vice versa. So we're all going to find new ways of working together to build a more complete picture of the universe. Richard Camuccio and Walton Rattray, thank you so much for speaking with us. Hey, thank you so much for your time. Sure, no problem. Richard Camuccio is a graduate research assistant at the Center for Gravitational Wave Astronomy. Walton Rattray is a grad student at the University of Texas, Rio Grande Valley. Coming up, why the weirdness of gravity on the quantum scale kept Stephen Hawking from formulating the long-sought theory of everything. It's Hawking Gravity on Big Picture Science. K-12 
can't wait for the next episode to drop? Well, be one of the first to listen to Big Picture Science a day early, only on Himalaya. Himalaya is a brand new podcast app where you can find every single podcast you love and some future faves. Whether you're a podcaster or a fan, Himalaya's got your back. Discover personally curated playlists and show your favorite podcasters some love with Himalaya's tip jar. It's free, it's the easiest to use, and we're adding cool new features every day. Go to your app store, download Himalaya, that's H-I-M-A-L-A-Y-A, and don't forget to follow Big Picture Science once you're there. Okay, gravity is nifty, also attractive. We're learning a lot about it, how it defines black hole behavior and produces gravitational waves. It looks like we're getting this whole gravity thing sorted out. Well, nope. Not even close. Such is the mystery of the universe. As brilliant a physicist as he was, some secrets about gravity eluded the great deductive and creative mind of Stephen Hawking. Like other theoretical physicists, Dr. Hawking was hoping to discover the theory of everything. This would be a theory that unites in one coherent framework all four forces of the universe. It is one of the major unsolved problems in physics, and here's why. While Einstein's theory of gravity works well in describing large-scale phenomena, it breaks down when used to describe gravity at very short distances, like within an atom. A good theory should be valid at every scale. While physicists are seeking the theory of everything, we were seeking a physicist to explain the theory of everything in terms we could understand. We needed someone qualified but also available on short notice, given that we didn't want to delay this episode on Stephen Hawking. We decided to go local and looked up the Berkeley Center for Theoretical Physics at the University of California, Berkeley. The website video included string theorist and professor of physics Raphael Busso, whose explanations were particularly articulate and enthusiastic. I emailed Dr. Busso asking for an interview, and he replied, Sure, how about this afternoon? I was surprised at his spontaneity and immediately set out for the campus. As it turns out, my interview with him was to hold another surprise as well. Raphael, when I say gravity, in your mind, do you translate it to space-time? Yes, because that's what gravity is to us now, ever since Einstein. Gravity is nothing but the laws that govern the changing shape of space and time. Can I continue to refer to gravity during the course of our conversation? Oh, absolutely. I I use the word all the time. (laughs) (laughs) Now, gravity is one of the four forces, I understand, that two of them we may be experiencing right now, gravity, and the other is electromagnetism. And then there are other forces that work on the quantum scale. Those are the the, uh, weak and the strong forces. Do I have that right? Yeah, that's right. Those are forces that Einstein, for example, didn't even know about yet. They're just four forces? (laughs) We don't know that for sure. Um, There could be other forces that we haven't been able to measure because they're too weak or we would require energies too large to access their effects. But those are the four forces that we see as a sort of relatively low energies that we can probe in experiments. Gravity is particularly perplexing because it works one way on the scale of large things, classical physics, but it works another way on the quantum scale, doesn't it? Can you explain? Well, I can't. I'm so sorry. Uh, <laughs> because because we don't really know how it works on the quantum scale. So that's the big goal, right? That's kind of the last major task of unification that we face in physics. Our, our, our history as a subject is a history of explaining more and more things with fewer and fewer equations, fewer and fewer conceptual ingredients. And, and so we've progressed a long way, and now the, you know, three of these four forces have found kind of a common roof under which they fit. It's called a quantum field theory, or more precisely, the standard model of particle physics. And it really explains everything we've ever measured and predicted many things we had not yet measured correctly about those three forces. But gravity doesn't fit under that roof. Can you say more about that? And in what way does gravity break down on the quantum scale? What weird things does it do? We've been pretty successful, I think, as a subject in explaining you know, these three forces. I, I don't want to sound like I'm discontent. This was a triumph of science. And it's um, natural to think that once you've done three, you can do the fourth. And so you go ahead and try that. 
and you use the formalism and all the powerful tools that you've learned in the process of, of figuring out how to find a quantum theory for three out of four, and all the equations just blow up in your face. Infinities appear that you can't get rid of. Uh, you know, nothing in nature, you know, you should ever get an infinity when you're doing a calculation that pertains to a sensible question, like what happens if you take two gravitational waves and you bounce them off of each other. You get nonsense answers. And that suggests to us that the whole framework that was so triumphant in the context of these other forces just isn't appropriate. There's something dramatically different about how gravity works. And Stephen Hawking's work, I think, has shed a lot of light on where else we should look and how else we should approach the problem. Now, I'm not a theoretical physicist. I would guess that most people are not. Maybe, sadly. Maybe, sadly, <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> Can you give us a definition of what is the theory of everything? Well, uh, what we're looking for is not a piecemeal description of nature. We're not looking to have, you know, one bunch of rules that apply to a certain set of phenomena, like, let's say, planets and galaxies and the large things. And then a bunch of different laws that apply to the small things, to subatomic scales, because, and this is kind of important, for one, we've just experienced that that is the wrong viewpoint. Nature, every single time that we had different sort of parcels and different parochial laws of physics for different uh, phenomena, sooner or later, that was overthrown. And there's a deeper reason for that, which is that it's basically impossible to draw a strict boundary between different kinds of phenomena. We might say, okay, this is kind of large, this is kind of small, but where exactly does something stop being small and we stop using one description and we start using a different one? So what we're looking for is a single unified description of all the phenomena in nature. And what we're left with currently are two big pieces, gravity and quantum mechanics. So the theory of everything that we're looking for would be putting these under one roof. And how do you know when you have it? Is it that you have figured out an equation and it comes together in a way that equations haven't in the past? Because this isn't experimental physics, is it? It's theoretical physics. You're, you're writing this down. You're doing math. In the case of Stephen Hawking, he was doing a lot right. of it in his mind. How do you know when you have it? That's a hard question in science generally. You never know that a theory is true. You never know that it's 100% true in the final word because you can do as many tests, experimental uh, measurements, observations uh, of the stars as you like. It might still be that the next one falsifies your theory. And so as, as many dramatic confirmations as you may have had. But of course, those dramatic confirmations give you more and more confidence. Now, for that to happen, we first have to have a theory. Currently with quantum gravity, we sort of have one theory, string theory, which at least achieves the enormous feat of putting those two phenomena under one roof. It's not necessarily the roof we want. It doesn't seem to fit in the kind of universe we see very well. But it's hard to express how difficult it is to come up with any kind of theoretical structure that doesn't immediately give you nonsense when you try to have gravity and quantum mechanics in it. And so that is our starting point for the time being, I think, for a lot of the questions that we're exploring. And string theory is what you work on at the University of California, Berkeley? It's part of what I work on. I think of myself as somebody who works on quantum gravity, on theoretical physics, and I work on string theory to the extent that I judge that to be a promising and appropriate tool. Did you ever meet Stephen Hawking? I was a student. I did not know that. Oh, that's so funny. I thought that's why you asked me to come to this interview. No, it's just a coincidence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I am surprised. I, I'm sorry I did not know that. You were just the person that I wanted to go to. What was it like to be his student? Oh, um, it was very nice to be his student. I, uh, it was an enormously exciting and wonderful time for me. Uh, very formative, both in terms of the physics and otherwise. Well, we have a sense of how gifted he was as a scientist. What were his particular gifts as as a professor? <laughs> well, I'm sure he had many gifts that I never got to see because he was also a, a colleague, and I think a very highly appreciated colleague in his department. Uh, but as an advisor, I would say, uh, well, I've, I enormously appreciated, for example, how inclusive he was of his students. He treated us sort of like family, and he took us along on trips. Uh, we got to meet all the luminaries of the day. 
And, and so that was, you know, that was just a, a fantastic opportunity to, to grow intellectually and to learn from him and from all these other people. Can you give an example of how he changed the way that you thought about the universe or physics? <laughs> well, I think he brought out an irreverent streak in me. He didn't <laughs> want to be <laughs> treated reverently. And um, in the beginning, I think I did, and I, I learned that that was kind of a bad idea, that, you know, both of us were going to have much more fun if I lost that excess respect. <laughs> and and that, that was, yeah, that was an interesting learning curve there. But that was about how to interact with him, not necessarily how to think about the universe, although maybe they're linked. Yeah, no, I, I think that I benefited from, you know, working, obviously, with one of the greatest scientists, but also one of the very few at the time who felt that it was worth spending their energy on gravity, on thinking about gravity as opposed to uh, sort of particle physics, where, you know, it was much easier to do experiments and there was enormous rapid progress uh, through, you know, all these colliders people were building, new particles were being discovered, Nobel Prizes were raining from the sky. and, And, you know, he could have done that and he chose not to. And I think that as time went on, that proved to be a very valuable resource for us. I think now when I look at PhD students, postdocs who are successful in my field, they are the ones who know an enormous amount about about gravity, the way a particle physicist traditionally would not have learned uh, the subject. And I think that's in large part something that grew out of the importance, the eventual recognition of the importance of Stevens' work in the 1970s. Well, coming back to string theory then, can you outline the idea of string theory for us? This idea that elementary particles vibrate like strings and each one is vibrating at a different frequency? Well, in a nutshell, is that it? Yeah, string theory is a really amazing theoretical structure that was sort of discovered more or less by accident. And one of the main problems we have with it is that it's not obvious what the most characteristic feature of it actually is. Should we think of it as, well, the the standard story that instead of having elementary particles, we have little wiggling strings and, you know, why are there different particles? Oh, because the strings can wiggle differently. And that sounds really great, but it misses a huge part of the theory. And it's not obvious that that's actually the best way to think about the theory. And then it was discovered that, oh, these strings actually contain gravity. Gravity is built into this theory. It's a quantum theory. Hooray, finally we have at least some quantum theory of gravity that we can work with. And then you start exploring this structure. It's a very rigid structure. You don't get to wiggle things very much. You don't get to adjust any numbers. And more and more things come out. Uh, The great Joe Polchinski, who recently passed away as well, discovered that the theory contains objects like membranes and higher dimensional versions thereof called D-brains. And they were always in that theory. It's not like you have a choice about it. But we didn't see that until we worked hard enough to see it. With the help of these deep brains, it's now become more likely that the theory can actually describe a universe such as ours. Can you picture the vibrating strings or these other membranes? If, if you close your eyes, can you, do you have a, like a 3D picture in your mind of what this looks like? You think about it every day. It's no better than your 3D picture. I mean, we can all picture a wiggling string. We can all picture a balloon that, you know, might vibrate or have, you know, different shapes. That will be a string or a membrane, right? But ultimately, nature doesn't care about what we can picture, Uh, But for some reason, nature likes to uh, use the language of math. And in the language of math, it's not hard to describe 10 dimensions. Do you think your advisor, Stephen Hawking, who spent a good part of his life imagining the universe, do you think he fared any better at imagining these dimensions? I think that he was a great geometer and that he clearly had a very visual way of thinking about space and time as well. But he, like everybody else, had to do the hard calculations to get his uh, major results. And that, it's, it's really the combination of, of those two things, I think, that make a great physicist, that you have both an intuitive and a visual mind, but also the ability to do the math. Rafael Busso, thank you so much for speaking to us. You're very welcome. It's my pleasure. Rafael Busso is a professor of physics at the University of California, Berkeley. His advisor at Cambridge University, where he earned his Ph.D., was Stephen Hawking. 
So we've heard in this show about how gravity remains a really puzzling subject. You know, 400 years ago, Newton figures out gravity, so he thinks, and we think he's got it figured out too. But then along comes Einstein. He says, well, you, you know, Newton didn't quite get it right. And then we think we've got it figured out. But then it turns out, well, that's not good enough. Consider black holes, something that intrigued Stephen Hawking from most of his career, actually. And he knew that black holes held the secret that would give us a theory that would explain gravity, both on the large scales and the small scales. He came up with Hawking radiation. That involves black holes. It involves gravity. But it didn't solve this fundamental problem. And I figure if Stephen Hawking couldn't solve this problem. It may be a while before anyone can. Thanks to the duo that helped hold the show together, senior producer Gary Niederhoff and operations manager Barbara Vance. Thanks also to financial support from Rena Shulsky David and Sammy David and to the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit scientific and education organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life, including the history of liquid water on Mars. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to an episode of Big Picture Science called Hawking Gravity. And if you want to hear more Big Picture Science, well, you'll find past episodes in our archive at bigpicturescience.org.